Oral questions, questions oral. The Honourable Opposition House Leader. This weekend, the Canadian Chamber of Commerce warned that the Prime Minister's plan to spy on Canadians' banking transactions could put our trade with the European Union at risk. The Chamber expressed serious concerns about unintended consequences on our trade with Europe, which would then affect Canadian small businesses. Instead of dismissing legitimate questions coming from Canadians who don't want to be spied on, and now further legitimate questions from the business community, will the Liberals just do the right thing and stop this unauthorized surveillance of Canadians? Thank you. Hey, hey. The Honourable Minister of Innovation. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member opposite for a very thoughtful question, and I just want to take this opportunity to highlight that our government has been very clear when it comes to protecting the privacy of Canadians and data protection, and that's very important. I also want to highlight that this particular initiative undertaken by Statistics Canada is a pilot project. No data has been collected, and StatsCan is working very closely with the Privacy Commissioner and with uh, banks as well to make sure that privacy of Canadians is protected. Honourable Opposition House Leader, order. Mr. Speaker, why is this Liberal government not understanding that Canadians don't trust them when it comes to protecting their private information? And the response of the government over the last two weeks has not given Canadians any more confidence. They're worried about their financial transactions being spied on. The business community is concerned. And instead of saying that the Liberals will fix this mess, they're doubling down and defending it. That is the wrong response, Mr. Speaker. What Canadians want to hear is that the Liberals will stop this unauthorized surveillance of their bank accounts. The Honourable Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, we recognize the concerns that Canadians have around privacy and around data protection as well. But what's really problematic is the over-the-top rhetoric by the members opposite. Let me give you an example, Mr. Speaker. Under Section 171 of the Statistics Act, no police, RCMP or CRA can actually access any personal information. The courts can't even compel Statistics Canada. They never have and never will compromise on personal information when it comes to Canadians' privacy. Mr. Speaker, if that were true, there wouldn't be an investigation against the government at present. The Liberal government is collecting information, personal, confidential information on Canadians without their consent. We learned on the weekend, just yesterday, in fact, and the day before, that that could threaten our trade with Europe. Will the Prime Minister finally understand that what's happening at present is unacceptable? This is an attack on people's privacy. What is the Prime Minister waiting for to take up his responsibilities and to put an end of this, uh, an end to this situation immediately? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government takes very seriously the privacy of Canadians. Let's be clear. This is a pilot project. No data has been collected. No data has been collected. Statistics Canada is working with the Privacy Condition Commissioner. The Honourable Member for Richmond Arthabasca. No data collected, but the Privacy Commissioner is going to be deepening an investigation. That's quite interesting. But let's talk about another issue that's of concern to Canadians. April 25th, the Member for Saint Leonard Saint Michel announced that he was leaving political life. June 12th, he made his farewell speech here in this House in front of all parliamentarians to say that he was leaving political life. September 27th, he says, all of a sudden, I'm going to take a month to reflect on my political career, except that now we've learned recently that the Prime Minister has supposedly given him a secret mandate. So the question for the Prime Minister is this, what is the secret mission? <laughs> The Honourable Government House Leader, Mr. Speaker, all members are accountable for their work to their constituents for the work in Ottawa. The member in question has said that he is reflecting on his future plans. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Order. Le, or, alors. Order. Alors. Order. 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 Order.
Mr. Speaker, five months ago, the member from St. Leonard, St. Michel, stood in this place and gave what we all thought was his resignation speech. Well, five months later, he's still an MP, being paid by the taxpayers, but appears to have not shown up for a day's work since then. Now, the member said that he's been working on a very special government responsibility assigned to him by the Prime Minister. So, can the Prime Minister tell this House what this highly important government job or assignment is that he gave to the member, which means the member doesn't have to show up for work? The Honourable Government House Leader. French, I will repeat in English that the Member of Parliament is responsible to their constituents for their work in Ottawa. The Member has stated that he is reflecting on his next steps. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Alarm. Order. L'Honorable. Alarm. Order. The Honourable Member for Rimouski Nejet, Temiskwata Le Basque. Bonjour, le Mexique. Several days ago, Mexico stated that it wouldn't ratify an, a, the new trade agreement until Tr President Trump hasn't abolished uh, tariffs on American steel and aluminum. That is what we call taking a stand, Mr. Speaker. Steelworkers came to Ottawa to call for exactly the same thing from the Liberal government, because these tariffs run the risk of forcing several companies from here to close down. Liberals are not listening. My question is very simple, Mr. Speaker. Why is the why does the Mexican government have a backbone, but not this Liberal government here in Ottawa? Ah. The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, this gives me an opportunity to point out that last Tuesday I attended uh, an event with Unifor to celebrate uh, the new trade agreement with Mexico and uh, the United States. And the head of the NDP was in attendance to celebrate, as was uh, the Quebec uh, Lieutenant, uh, the member for Rosemont, La Petite Patrie. He said, uh, at the mic that it was a good agreement. So what is the position of the NDP on this subject? The, Ramuski... the Honourable Member for Rumsky Nejet Temiskwata de Basque. Well, we're wondering why the Mexican government has a backbone but not this government. Now, this is a sad anniversary, Mr. Speaker, because a year ago the Paradise Papers came out. But prior to those papers, there were the Panama Papers, the Luxembourg leaks, the Swiss leaks, the offshore leaks, and the KPMG scandals to help uh, Canadians avoid paying their taxes. In all these cases, the revenue agency was unable to take action or simply pardon to these people who are guilty. Instead of persecuting people who are receiving benefits, well, no, that's where they're effective and they're working on that. Why is there a double standard when it comes to action on the pa Paradise Papers? Mr. Speaker, allow me to read what the member for Rosemont La Petite Patrie said to the Canadian negotiators. He said, I just want to congratulate everyone in this room for the fantastic work that you have accomplished. He added, saying that uh, the trade agreement represented the best agreement possible and protected workers across the country. We agree. The agreement is delivering the goods. Stability, it's saving jobs, it's protecting jobs in Canada as well. well member for Essex. Well, I'm not surprised the Liberals don't want to talk about the Paradise Papers. Uh, the Paradise Papers was a huge leak of financial documents that revealed how politicians, multinationals, and the wealthiest evade taxes. As a working class Canadian, try dodging taxes and see how that works out. Not only have the ultra wealthy rigged the system completely for them, but we are all paying the price. Tax dodging deprives Canadians of our public services like health care, and this government is doing nothing to stop it. Instead of going after the big bucks, Liberals continue to go after the little guys. When is this government going to find some courage and stop tax evasion in Canada? Nice. Is comparing apples and oranges. The reality is, is that we reinvested in CRA. We've made sure to counter tax invasion by an, investing more than $500 million to counter tax evasion. And also, at the same time, we've been reinvesting in the public service to make sure that Canadians have access to really good public service and good services in terms of uh, programs and, and support all across the country. We can do both, and that's exactly what our government is doing. Thank you. Good. Order. The Honourable Member for Essex. New Democrats are calling on this Liberal government not to sign the USMCA until steel and aluminum tariffs on Canadian workers are removed. This is about jobs, 
This is about Canadians' livelihoods. This is about keeping Canadian shops open. Trump's unjustified tariffs are having a devastating impact on Canadian workers and their families. No wonder Mexico announced that it wouldn't sign the deal until the tariffs on their workers are gone. Will this government do the right thing and not sign this deal until steel and aluminum tariffs are removed? Honourable Minister Transport. I have to say I'm surprised again. Once again, uh, I have to remind my colleague from the other side that the leader of the NDP was at a reception celebrating the fact that Canada had arrived at a deal on USMCA. In fact, their Quebec lieutenant, the member from rosemont la patrie actually said this was the best deal possible. He said this at, at an occasion that was multipartisan and very, very clearly indicated that the NDP is quite pleased with the deal that we arrived at in this government. An honourable member for Central Okanagan, Milk Maine, Nicola. Mr. Speaker, last week the Prime Minister went to extraordinary lengths to defend the Liberals' plan to engage in the unauthorized surveillance of Canadians' personal banking information. We also learned that they have already seized 15 years of private information from a credit rating bureau of potentially millions of Canadians. They did all of this without the knowledge or consent of any impacted Canadians. Will the government delete all the information they've already secretly collected and end their plans to collect even more information, Mr. Speaker? Mr. Speaker, we've been very clear about our concerns around privacy and data protection. That is why our government introduced new regulations when it comes to PIPRA to further strengthen privacy. That's why we're actually engaged with the Canadians around further data protection. With respect to personal information and the request made under this pilot project, it is clear that all this personal information will be removed, Mr. Speaker. Under Section 17.1 of the Statistics Act, the government cannot compel stats, can't, the opposition can't, the courts can't, the national security agencies can't. Bottom line is the privacy of Canadians has been and will always be protected. I thank the member for his patience. I'd ask all members to be patient and listen when someone else has the floor. Remember, we each get our turn eventually. The Honourable Member for Central Okanagan's Milk Maine, Nicola. Mr. Speaker, the government on Friday claimed that this pilot project also was still in design, but they actually were secretly getting the accounts of potentially millions of Canadians from our credit bureau. Now, uh, Mr. Speaker, specifically, Conservatives have sponsored a petition calling for the end of this program that in just a few days has already, uh, already received 14,000 signatures. Now, Canadians care about their privacy even if this government doesn't. The chief statistician says they can't ask for consent because most Canadians will refuse to give it. Is it seriously the position of the government? They can't get consent from Canadians to collect this data? They'll just do it secretly behind their backs. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, we already had this debate in 2015 when the members opposite said when it came to the long-form census, we want to make it voluntary. You know what that resulted in? 1,128 communities did not receive good quality, reliable data. That impacted communities and businesses and Canadians right across this country. We're willing to have this debate, Mr. Speaker. StatsCan has been very clear they'll continue to protect the privacy of Canadians, protect data, Mr. Speaker, and the members opposite just don't trust good quality, reliable data. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, I don't think the Liberals understand the seriousness of the situation they themselves created. Honest Canadians don't want Liberal government, the Liberal government delving into their bank accounts. It's simple. And the Liberal government doesn't want to understand that. This is a direct attack on their dignity, their privacy, and the Liberal Party, the Liberal government, has no business putting its nose into people's bank accounts. Why is the government so bent on going in this direction? The Honourable Minister. Pretty, you know ordinary behavior from the members opposite, because this is Stephen Harper's party. This is about fear mongering. This is about going over the top with their rhetoric. This is about scare tactics, Mr. Speaker. What they fail to disclose to Canadians is that any information that Statistics Canada collects, personal information is first of all removed. Secondly, Statistics Canada has been very clear. They will never ever disclose that information to anyone. And with regards to this pilot project, they've engaged the Privacy Commissioner and they'll address any issues Statistics Canada will around privacy and data protection. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. 
Well, Mr. Speaker, what we're seeing here is that Liberal government is wanting to uh, snoop into people's banks account, bank accounts, and that runs counter to our democracy. On the contrary, the government says that it's a pilot project. Pilot or not, it makes no sense. A pilot project is something that they want to say, but l Canadians want nothing to do with this. On the weekend, that's what they told me. The Chamber of Commerce on the weekend said that it could have a detrimental effect on trade with Europe. Why is the government so intent on going in this direction? The Honourable Minister. Um, Mr. Speaker, Canadians understand the importance of privacy. They understand the importance of data protection. They also understand the importance of good quality, reliable data. This data that is under process under the pilot project, for example, can help the Bank of Canada so they can look at how to make monetary decisions around interest rate policy. This helps around consumer price index to make sure that individuals get the appropriate benefits under OAS and CPP. This is about evidence-based evidence -based decision making. The members opposite have a problem against Statistics Canada and they have a problem against good quality, reliable data. Honourable Member for Chilliwack Hope. Yes, Mr. Speaker, Canadians do take their privacy very seriously, which is why they don't want this government stealing their financial information without their consent. This government has been, there is documentation, 800 pages worth, of this government violating the privacy of hundreds of thousands of Canadians just in the last 19 months alone. So now what the government is saying, if Canadians won't willingly give their private financial data, they'll just take it by force and without their consent. Why don't they put an end to that today? Stop this unauthorized surveillance of Canadians' personal private data. The Honourable Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, not one single breach where any information is actually on the servers. The members opposite, again, are over the top with their rhetoric. They're over the top when it comes to fear-mongering and misleading Canadians because they fundamentally don't believe in good quality, reliable data. They had this debate with the mandatory long-form census. We won that debate because Canadians understand the importance of reliable data to help communities, to help Canadians, Canadians to help businesses, Mr. Speaker. We're willing to have this debate, and I can tell you right now, when it comes to privacy and data protection, Canadians respect StatsCan. Order, there's far too much noise here. The Honourable Member for Chilliwack Hope. Well, Mr. Speaker, last week the government said that Canadians trusted them with this data and that we in the official opposition should just get on board with this program for the government to harvest the financial data of Canadians. Uh, no, Mr. Speaker, we won't do that. We're standing up for Canadians who have not given their consent for this government to go snooping around their private financial transactions, their credit transactions, their debit transactions, their mortgage payments, all of it's on the table. Why doesn't the Prime Minister put an end to this invasion of privacy and unauthorized government surveillance and do it today? The Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, all personal information will be removed. The members opposite know that. The members opposite also know that there's been no breaches when it comes to Statistics Canada's server. The problem is, Mr. Speaker, the members opposite just don't trust StatsCan. They don't like good quality, reliable data. They don't want Canadians to see a government make decisions based on evidence. They have a fundamental problem against data, against the facts, against science. We've had this debate before, and we continue to have this debate, and we look forward to the debate come the next election. Deputy. The Honourable Member for Allah. Order. Remind members that most members are able to sit through question period and hear things they don't like without reacting. They may be hard, but most are adult and can do it. Most in all parties are able to do it, and I'm sure the rest can as well. The Honourable Member for Jonquière. Mr. Speaker, since 2016, there's some $372 million promised to our veterans that went unspent. Our veterans deserve good quality services. There aren't hundreds of ways of improving services. They need to invest the money as promised. In, under our motion today, the government uh, would automatically carry over all unused funds to the following year, which would solve the problem, the funding problem facing uh, Veterans Affairs. Will the Liberals make the right decision, set partisanship aside, and support our motion? The Honourable Minister of National Defence. 
Mr. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to stand on behalf of the government and talk about the support that our government is giving to veterans. Anytime when it comes to nurses uh, for our veterans, we will uh, support it, Mr. Speaker. We've listened to our veterans, Mr. Speaker. That's why we delivered the pension for life, reopened the nine offices previously uh, closed by the Harper Conservatives, hired over 470 staff uh, for, uh, as well, put forward a joint uh, suicide prevention strategy, created uh, the Veterans Emergency Fund, Mr. Speaker, and the list goes on, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, when it comes to our veterans, Mr. Speaker, we will support them. Thank you. The member for Courtney Alberni. Mr. Speaker, while well, backlogs for processing veterans applications for disability, earnings loss benefits, and every other program are growing, the Liberals have left $372 million unspent at Veterans Affairs. This government is failing our veterans, meeting just 12 of its 24 self-identified service standards, and have not hired the caseworkers they promised. First Conservatives left over a billion dollars unspent. Now the Liberals have followed suit. Canadians know veterans deserve better. Will the government support our motion and make use of this lap spending so veterans get the services they need? The Honourable Minister of National Defence. Aaron. Mr. Speaker, as I stated, when it comes to uh, any motions of supporting our veterans, our government uh, will be supporting that motion. The benefits are demand-driven, so whether 10 or 10,000 eligible veterans come forward, they receive benefits. These are based on estimates, and this process guarantees that whether a veteran comes forward this year or the following year, we will always have the resources available for veterans. When we took office, we immediately increased financial support putting more money in the veterans' pockets, increasing mental health support, and delivering on the province that we made to veterans. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Carleton. The government admits that when its uh, carbon tax reaches $50 a tonne, the cost to the average family will be around $300. Now, even if you believe those bogus numbers, they don't take into to account a document released just last week wherein the government admits that after the next election, it will consider raising the carbon tax even further. If that's the case, they should be honest about it now. Can they guarantee, yes or no, whether the tax will go higher than the government has currently admitted? Yes or no? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased the Honourable Member opposite contemplates that the Liberals will still be in power after the next election. Uh, the fact is we've been uh, transparent from the beginning about our, our plan to protect the environment and grow the economy. Our national climate plan has been posted on our website since the day it was negotiated. Part of that plan, and I'm proud to stand by it, is to put a price on pollution that will max it at $50 a tonne by 2022. We will conduct a review of the policy at that time. Mr. Speaker, if the Honourable Member is so concerned with transparency, I'd suggest he looks inward and asks the Honourable Leader of the Opposition why he deleted his plan from his leader's website in May of 2017. Honourable Member for Carleton. So there you have it. There will be a review of the price in 2022 after the election is over. So Canadians would have to wake up to that nightmare after having voted to choose the next government. You know, this government, oh, this government already broke its promises on the deficit, already broke promises on taxes for the middle class. Now, they're setting up for yet another broken promise with a carbon tax on gas, home heating and other essentials that will be much higher than the government admits. Will it rule out that the tax will be higher than they now admit? Yes or no? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it's interesting now that the Conservative Party of Canada seems opposed to reviewing policies periodically because they seem to prefer basing their decisions on ideology rather than facts, science, or evidence. Mr. Speaker, we campaign on a commitment to protect our environment and grow the economy at the same time. I'm proud that we've implemented a price on pollution that's going to leave middle-class families better off. And if there is a nightmare here, Mr. Speaker, it's going to be during the next campaign when the Conservatives are trying to take money from their constituents so they can make pollution free again. Honourable Member for Carleton. Well, pollution under the Liberal plan is absolutely free for any large industrial polluter that emits more than 50,000 tonnes of greenhouse gases. But it's not free for a grandmother trying to heat her home in minus 30 degree weather. It's not free for a middle class single mom taking her child to soccer. It's not free for a small business. They all deserve to know, will the tax go even higher? after the next election, if by some godforsaken outcome this, this party wins the, that election. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. 
Mr. Speaker, just because the honourable member opposite has the ability to repeat a falsehood does not make it true. The fact is, we put a price on pollution, including a price for big emitters. There's a standard set in different industries, and if the big emitters exceed that standard, then they pay a price on pollution. Mr. Speaker, uh, Stephen Harper's former director of policy has indicated that families can expect to be better off. Uh, Doug Ford's chief budget advisor has advocated on behalf of putting a price on pollution. Even Stephen Harper, back in 2008, suggested that the plan for put it going forward should involve an effective price of $65 a ton. The fact is, families will be left better off under our plan, Mr. Speaker. It's this point. The honourable member for Carleton. Well, Mr. Speaker, the honourable member is suggesting that his own government documents are false. They indicate that not only will large industrial emitters get up to a 90% exemption on uh, their, the carbon tax, but even if they exceed that 90%, they can use something called surplus credits or eligible offset credits to avoid paying any tax whatsoever. So yes, pollution will be free for the large polluters. But how much will the average Canadian family have to pay? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Honourable uh, Member's repetition uh, does not make the falsehood true, nor does his use of air quotes in this uh, circumstance, Mr. Speaker. The fact is, we campaign on a commitment to protect our environment and grow the economy at the same time. Part of our plan to protect the environment includes putting a price on pollution. This is going to leave middle-class families better off, Mr. Speaker. If you don't believe me, you can look to Stephen Harper's former Director of Policy. You can look to Doug Ford's Chief Budget Advisor. You can look to the Nobel Prize winner in economics from this year. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, we're moving forward with plan that will protect our environment, leave families better off, and I'm disappointed that the Conservatives want to take money from their constituents to make pollution. The Honourable, the Honourable Member for Santé Saint bagot Mr. Speaker, when it comes to medical aid in dying, the government has shown a lack of sensitivity and has set up an overly restrictive law. Denise Bejean, one of my constituents who has a serious degenerative illness, is asking for medical aid in dying. But her request has been turned down because her death is not immediately foreseeable. The government should not be making this choice instead of the people themselves. Will the government respect these people's wishes as well as the Supreme Court ruling? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to answer the question. Medical assistance in dying is an incredibly complex, sensitive, and deeply personal issue. Our government put forward legislation, legislation that we're proud forms the national framework around medical assistance in dying, which draws the correct balance between balancing the autonomy of individuals and protecting vulnerable people. We are continuing to have a discussion around medical assistance in dying. We have. Um, According to the legislation, commissioned three reviews, reviews on highly complex issues that will be coming back in December and look forward to having further conversations about it. Here, here. Member for Victoria. In 2016, Bob Hergott had to sign his request for medical assistance in dying in a bus shelter. Then in 2017, Doreen Nowicki was forced to receive her assessment for ending her life on the sidewalk. Edmonton's Covenant Health Hospitals, where these patients were treated, have banned these activities on their properties. Mr. Speaker, enough is enough. Will the Liberals actually defend their legislation, show some leadership, and ensure that the constitutional rights of terminally ill patients right. are upheld across Canada? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, medical assistance in dying is a deeply complex, sensitive, and a deeply personal matter for individuals that are seeking to access medical assistance in dying. Our government introduced Bill C-14 in response to the Supreme Court of Canada decision in Jordan. We are confident that our legislation strikes the right balance between protecting uh, vulnerable people and respecting the personal autonomy of individuals, as well as recognizing the conscience right of health care practitioners. We will continue to have a conversation around medical assistance in dying. We have commissioned three reviews according to the legislation that look at complex issues. Member from the West. Mr. Speaker, a month ago in Halifax was the naming ceremony of Canada's first Arctic and offshore patrol ship, the first naval ship built in Canada in 20 years, and our government delivered it. As part of Strong, Secure, Engage, Canada's defence policy, we committed to building at least five Arctic and offshore patrol ships to bolster the Royal Canadian Navy's capabilities. Shipbuilding is an important part of our local economy. Can the Minister of National Defence explain how our government is continuing 
to create significant opportunities for Nova Scotians while ensuring our Navy has the tools they need. Thank you. Here, here. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member from West Nova for his tre tremendous and tireless work. Mr. Speaker, as, our, as promised, our government is strengthening the capability of the Royal Canadian Navy. And last week, I was proud to announce that we will move ahead with the acquisition of, the, of a sixth Arctic and offshore patrol ship. This will create good middle class uh, jobs for workers in Halifax and across Nova Scotia. And this is a great day for Halifax, Mr. Speaker, and a great day for the Royal Canadian Navy. Thank you. Honourable member for Charlebourg, Haute Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, instead of ending drug smuggling in prisons, the Prime Minister has chosen to set up a needle exchange program for prisoners, another harebrained initiative that threatens the safety of both inmates and prison guards. The union is appalled by this decision and is calling on the government to change course immediately. Yet again, the Prime Minister is showing his sympathy for criminals while dismissing the concerns of law-abiding citizens. Will the Prime Minister admit that his plan puts prison guards in danger? For public safety. I know, in fact, Mr. Speaker, for quite some time now, uh, in, the, uh, in the correctional system, the, uh, uh, the Correctional Service of Canada has properly managed the use of EpiPens, for example, and uh, insulin syringes. Uh, so there, there's well-established procedure for, for uh, dealing with these circumstances in a safe way to prevent the spread of disease and to save lives, Mr. Speaker. Public safety is what this is all about. Uh, member for That has nothing to do with it, Mr. Speaker. Handing out syringes to people in prisons doesn't make any sense. Now, the Immigration and Refugee Board is sounding the alarm, warning that new asylum seekers may have to wait up to two years to find out if they can stay in Canada or not. 60,000 new applications are expected this year. The Liberals have set aside $74 million to deal with the backlog, and the provinces are asking for another $400 million in compensation. All this waste because of the Prime Minister and his reckless propaganda at taxpayers' expense. Will the Prime Minister admit that he's made a huge mess of our immigration system? The Minister of Border Security. Yes. yes, Mr. Speaker. Let me be very, very clear that after years of chronic underfunding and understaffing, we have been restoring the capacity of the RRB to, to deal with those who have come to our country seeking asylum. And Mr. Speaker, I think it's also a good opportunity to remind all Canadians who these people are. Their families with children, almost half of whom are children. They're thoroughly vetted to ensure that they represent no risk to public safety or national security by the RCMP. And I want to assure the member opposite is nothing to be afraid of. The Honourable Member for Calgary Knows Hill. Last week on CBC, the Minister of Immigration said that his Ontario counterparts claims that 40% of Toronto's homeless shelter occupants were refugees and asylum seekers were, quote, not based on facts. Well, the CBC fact-checked the minister and found that Minister McLeod's claims are, in fact, valid. Wow. Was the minister inten intentionally misleading Canadians, or does he not know the basic facts of his file? In either scenario, would Canadian why should Canadians trust him to fix his illegal border crossing mess. Honourable Minister of Immigration. Speaker, I was on television to talk about our immigration levels that Canadians have been asking us to increase in order to meet our employer uh, short, um, our employee shortages as well as uh, skills shortages around the country. And we've responded with an ambitious and, and, and a well-measured immigration plan. We've done that after listening to Canadians. We've held hundreds of town halls across the country, something that the party opposite has not done. In fact, the member opposite has just come around to the understanding that it's important to talk to Canadians about immigration for, the, for three years. After blocking people on Twitter, that's the only way Canadians can actually get a hold of her. The Honourable Member Order for Calgary Nose Hill. It's a lot of angry, Mr. Speaker. We are angry. The reality, Mr. Speaker, is that Canadian taxpayers are on the hook for hundreds of millions of dollars for the Prime Minister's hashtag Welcome to Canada illegal border crossing program. Right. Instead of trying to fix the problem, the Prime Minister is allowing his cabinet to attempt to attempt to bully anyone who questions whether we should pay for those thousands of people who are illegally entering Canada. Will the minister apologize for his bullying attempt to Minister McLeod? Honourable Minister of Border Security. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to assure the member opposite that we have been working very carefully with the province of Ontario, the province of Quebec, the City of Toronto. I have met and had a number of conversations with the minister and mayors responsible. We are, we are working hard to ensure that Canadian law is upheld and that we uphold our responsibilities to anyone who seeks the protection of the, of the country and to treat them in, in an appropriate way according to our laws. Mr. Speaker, we are achieving significant success in reducing the number of people that have presented themselves. Order. The Honourable Member for Abbotsford seems to think he doesn't need the, uh, to have the floor to speak in the House, and I'd ask him to remember that he does, because he wouldn't want to not have it. The Honourable Member for Berthier Masquenonge. Mr. Speaker, nearly three years ago, my colleague for Winter West asked the Minister to ensure that all Canadian jobs would be protected when Lowe's bought Rona. You can imagine their shock when employees were told their store would close and that in January, none of them would have jobs. Nine stores are closing in Quebec and 31 across the country. The company says that American workers will be given new jobs, but they haven't given the same assurance to their Canadian employees. Mr. Speaker, given that these jobs are in danger, what will the minister do to protect our workers? Je voudrais remercier ma, ma collègue pour uh, sa question. Uh, nos pensées vont, uh, vont aux travailleurs, aux familles et aux communautés uh, touchées par ces fermetures de magasins. Nous... We will protect all members uh, who's, uh, who were affected by these closures. This transaction was examined to ensure that it would have a positive effect uh, economically for Canada. We will continue to work with these workers. Mr. West. Well, Mr. Speaker, Lowe's has announced they will be closing 31 stores across Canada, firing thousands of workers. The government was warned this foreign takeover would reduce competition and close stores. The pattern was clear. Best Buy took over Future Shop, workers fired. Target took over Zellers, workers fired. And then Lowe's came after Rona, workers fired. And who greenlighted all this? This minister. Yep. Instead of plywood on shelves, now it's being used to place on the windows and the doors of the stores. Yep. Can the minister explain why in the U.S. no one will lose their job from Lowe's closures, whereas the deal he cut for Canada has thousands of workers fired? Why is he the only one left with a job? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, again, I understand the concern raised by the member opposite, and of course our hearts go out to the workers, their families, and the community impacted by these store closures. We were always concerned, and we always remain concerned when we hear about job losses. And the member is correct. Under the Investment Canada Act, we actually did a thorough investigation and looked into the matter, and we also consulted the Quebec government as well. We were able to secure the headquarters in Boucherville and all the associated senior management positions, and we'll continue to to monitor the situation on an ongoing basis. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for chicoutimi le Fjord. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals are still trying to cover up an embarrassing situation. Maybe that's why the government has dumped some 135,000 documents on the courts. Those who are defending Vice Admiral Norbin are still not sure if the government is really willing to cooperate. So my question is very simple. Will the government commit to providing all of the documents necessary uh, if the judge so orders? For public safety. Uh, there is obviously an outstanding legal proceeding before the courts right now. Uh, the, uh, the matter of the disclosure of documents uh, is a matter that the judge is seized of in that case. Uh, the various parties to the, uh, to the court proceeding will make their legal arguments uh, and the judge will decide uh, with respect to issues such as privilege and confidence. It's in the hands of the courts and that's where it should be determined. The Honourable Member for Durham. Mr. Speaker, the government for over a month was pleading with us to stop asking questions about the Mark Norman trial. Then suddenly something amazing on Friday happened. They finally turned the confidential documents over to the court, Mr. Speaker. I guess better is possible, Mr. Speaker. Will the government confirm today that they will waive all cabinet confidences over documents that judge deems relevant so that Admiral Mark Norman can receive a fair trial. Mr. Speaker, we have been saying over, for over a month 
that uh, both sides in this legal proceeding, the prosecution and the defence, have competent, independent counsel. In the case of the prosecution, it's the Prosecu Public Prosecution Service of Canada. Uh, the defence obviously has very capable counsel. Uh, they will take the proceedings that they believe are relevant. The, the matter is in the hands of the judge in the case, and the judge will decide. That's how our court system works, Mr. Speaker. Well, member for Durham. Mr. Speaker, now that the government has been forced to hand over the documents in the Admiral Norman legal matter, the questions of several conflict of interests surrounding Liberal ministers and members of Parliament remain, Mr. Speaker. So in the, it, to be transparent, will the government release all 73 names that their own investigation revealed were aware of Cabinet secrets regarding the Davies shipbuilding decision? From Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, as we've said from the very outset in this matter, this case is before the courts. We have an independent judicial system. It is up to representatives for the Crown and representatives for the defence to make their respective arguments in court, and the courts will determine the right way to proceed going forward. I would hazard to guess that the courts in this country don't need the assistance of the official opposition. General Member for Edmonton Centre. Mr. Speaker, under the Conservative government, nothing was done to support our artists to modernize our laws and culture. After this decade of indifference for our artists and creators, our government is taking action. Last week, our government announced reforms aimed at modernizing the Copyright Act. Grâce au changement à la commission. Thanks to the changes to the Copyright Act, artists will be paid more quickly and fairly for their work. Can the Minister of Canadian Heritage and Multiculturalism please tell us what this reform means for our artists and creators? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for Edmonton Centre for his excellent question. Excellent. The Copyright Board plays an important role and allows artists and creators to be fairly compensated for their work, but it took years to approve royalties and render decisions. Why, Mr. Speaker? Because the Conservatives did nothing uh -oh. to modernize the board. So, we took action. Is he saying... These measures will help simplify the decision-making process, reduce delays, and we will continue to work with our artists and to ensure that they are paid on time and fairly. Perfect. Sherwood Park, Port Saskatchewan. Mr. Speaker, Asya Bibi spent eight years in solitary confinement in Pakistan in the world's most high-profile blasphemy case. We are excited about her acquittal, but she and her family remain in grave danger. Ministerial permits have been used in the past to help vulnerable victims of false blasphemy charges in Pakistan, such as in the case of Rimsha Masi under the previous government. So will the minister continue this proud Canadian tradition and offer asylum to Asya Bibi and her family? Honourable Parliament, the Secretary for Canada U.S. Relations. Mr. Speaker, the right of freedom of religion or belief must and shall be protected. We're very relieved that the Supreme Court of Pakistan is clear in Asghar Bibi of charges of blasphemy. And we urge the government of Pakistan to take all necessary steps to ensure the safety of Asia Bibi and her family. We continue to urge the government and people of Pakistan to reform the application of the blasphemy laws to prevent the targeting of religious minorities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Esquimalt, Saanich Souk. Mr. Speaker, Tanzania has announced a government task force which tomorrow will begin hunting down and arresting people who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and intersex, with penalties ranging from 30 years to life in prison. The public has been asked to report gay people using a government snitch line. Hundreds have already been forced into hiding. Amnesty International and others have condemned this hate campaign, and even the United States has issued a travel warning for Americans in Tanzania. Canada has done nothing. Will the government speak out against this incitement to hatred, persecution, and violence? Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, Minister of International Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our government believes that the human rights of all persons to be universal and indivisible, and these include the human rights of LGBTQ persons. We will continue to champion respect for diversity and human rights, including the rights of LGBTQ persons, with fellow members of the international community, including with Tanzania. We will continue to work with the countries to ensure the rights of all in individuals are respected and protected. Thank Bravo. you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Avignon, Amitis Matan Matapedia. Mr. Speaker, our government provides the Navy and the Coast Guard with the ships that they need to serve Canadians. While generating good middle class jobs, 
and significant economic spin-offs for Quebec and all of Canada. As part of the national shipbuilding strategy, we've already awarded over a billion dollars in contracts to Quebec companies. In this way, we're supporting hundreds of workers and local economies. Can the Minister of Public Services and Procurement tell the House what our government is doing for Quebecers and Canadians as part of the national uh, shipbuilding strategy? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the Honourable Member for his question. We have awarded 17% of national shipbuilding strategy contracts to Quebec companies. Last summer, we awarded a $610 million contract to the Davy Shipyard for icebreakers. Last week, we awarded part of a $7 billion maintenance contract to Davy for the maintenance of 12 Halifax class frigates. So we are continuing to create good jobs for Quebec. Oh, member for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Mr. Speaker, I would have a lot to say about the government's approach to religious freedom and human rights. My question was about the issue of asylum for Asia Bibi and her family. Time is of the essence. The family has specifically asked the Prime Minister of Canada to intervene. Shabazz Bhatti and Salman Tassir were killed because of their advocacy on this case. Over 150 violent demonstrators have been arrested over the last few days, most of whom were specifically called for Asia to be killed. So again, my question for the Minister of Immigration, will the government offer asylum to Asia Bibi and her family? No. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary for Canada, U.S. Relations. Mr. Speaker, with like-minded friends and allies, there are discreet and delicate discussions underway, and I will not say anything further at this time. The Honourable Member for Pierre Boucher et Patrick Vercher. Mr. Speaker, when Rona was bought out by the U.S. giant Lowe's, the government had the power to set the terms of the transaction. They could have set conditions, for example, protecting jobs and stores. We asked the government to do so, but they did nothing. The result? Well, today we've learned that nine Rona stores are going to close in Quebec. There are 40 Liberal MPs from Quebec who did nothing to protect our workers. How can they justify their inaction to the people who are losing their jobs? The Honourable Minister for Innovation. Mr. Speaker, our thoughts are with the workers, families and communities affected by these store closures. We are always concerned when we learn of any job losses. This transaction was examined to ensure that it would have an overall uh, positive economic impact for Canada. Consultations were also held with the province of Quebec. These uh, conditions need to be respected, and we are uh, working to ensure that they will be. The Honourable Member for Repentigny. Quebec TV series are adapted all around the world. Our filmmakers are no strangers to the Cannes Film Festival or Hollywood Boulevard in Oscar season. But don't bother looking for us on Netflix, Mr. Speaker. In the $500 million, $500 million agreement signed a year ago, not a single cent went to producing original French language content. Netflix's contribution to our culture is nil. When will the government force these web giants to do their fair share and force them to uh, charge taxes so that they can, we can invest that money in our culture. The Honourable Minister of Heritage. Mr. Speaker, the government is here for our artists. We've made significant uh, investments in the Canada Media Fund and our culture. And we, of course, we know that our uh, laws are 20 years old and we need to update them for the digital age, so we ha we've created a committee to meet that end. We are going to make laws based on certain principles, including that everyone participating in the system has to contribute to the system. Nobody gets a free pass. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Families, Children and Social Development. This is a follow-up to my question last week. I don't believe that the Minister grasps the severity of Nunavut's housing shortage. Yes, $240 million has been allocated. It sounds like a lot, but it's over 10 years. That's 48 new houses per year for the entire territory, less than two per community. This is a crisis. Overcrowding is contributing to our high, rate, high rates of youth suicide and tuberculosis. No Canadian should live like this. So I ask again, will the Minister take immediate action to work with the government and Nunavut to solve this crisis? Thank you, Mr. 
The Honourable Minister of Social Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am pleased but sad to address this question. Indeed, we are in a crisis in many parts of Canada, and that's because the federal government failed over many years to acknowledge its responsibility to look after the housing needs of many communities across Canada, failed to address the particular housing needs and conditions in northern Canada, failed to work appropriately and respectfully with Indigenous peoples, including the Inuit. And I'm glad to say that this is changing. This is going to keep changing over the next 10 years through the first ever national housing strategy. Bravo. Yeah, yeah.